Hi, and welcome back to Les's Lab. In this episode, we're going to take a look at a homemade 10 watt laser dial driver. So let's stick this on the bench and take a look. This episode is sponsored by JLC PCB, who is the manufacturer that produced the printed circuit boards for this project. JLC PCB can manufacture high quality PCBs up to six layers, starting at just $2 for one to four layer PCBs with fast turnaround and online real time order tracking. JLC PCB don't just produce PCBs, they also offer an SMD assembly service if you would like to have your circuits fully manufactured. They also offer a 3D printing service for if you don't happen to have a 3D printer at home. Take a look at the website that I'll link in down below. So I was recently in the market for an 808 nanometer pump diode for an upcoming DPSS laser project that I've got on the go. And when I was looking around, I found this company in Shenzhen, China. This is Box Optronics Tech. I'll link them in down below, actually, because they were really very helpful. Um, when you get into a conversation with these guys, uh, they give you the option to customize the product that you're buying from them. So I wanted a fiber coupled 808 nanometer um, laser diode. I wanted it to be 10 watts and I wanted the end of the fiber to be terminated in an SMA905 uh, for my particular application and um, they did that for me. So let's have a look at the actual laser diode itself. So this is the laser diode itself that they sent me. I've actually mounted it on an old Xeon heat sink for testing purposes and for a stable mounting platform as well. I've drilled a big hole in the middle of it here so I can mount it firmly onto the optical bench. If we tilt it up a little bit we can see the laser diode itself. It's basically the width of my uh, index fingernail so it's very very small for 10 watts and then we've got the fiber coming out and then it's terminated in the SMA905 connector at the front there. Um, mounted this on a little flange uh, again for stability you know if you're going to be um, messing with uh, multiple watt lasers um, you want to be able to bolt things down and secure them in a sensible fashion so they can't fall off and inadvertently expose yourself or anybody else to the, the laser beam and if we pull the cover off there we'll see the end of the bare fiber. So here's the data sheet for this and we can see that the power out is 10 watts at 808 nanometers. Um, the current is 12 amps and the operating voltage is 1.8 volts. So we need a power supply capable of delivering about 2 volts at up to 10 amps. I'm never going to drive this at 12. Um, but yeah, excellent. These all come with an individual test sheet um, so we can see the actual test conditions when it left the factory which is you know quite unusual for components. Um, but yeah, so we can see that at 10 watts of output they were driving it at 10.5 amps. Um, with 1.9 volts um, as the voltage drop across the diode. Uh, we've got slope efficiency. Um, excellent. Everything we would need on there. Perfect. Um, the only thing that's really left then, in order to power this, we need a suitable power supply. And power supplies aren't easy to get hold of that will deliver, you know, 10 amps at just a couple of volts. Um, that are very, very highly regulated. Um, and so I set out to design and build my own. So let's have a look at that. So this is the schematic for the 10 watt laser diode driver that I've designed. Laser diodes will draw as much current as you can throw at them. So if you just connected one up to a bare supply, it would draw current until it melted. Um, and that's obviously bad. Um, so what we need is a current regulator, and that's essentially what this is. It's an adjustable current regulator based around the LM358. Um, there was a couple of issues in the design of this. Uh, the LM358 really, really likes to oscillate, and so I've had to put a rather large um, RC network over on the output uh, to stop that from happening, but you know, other than that, it's not too bad. Um, the LM358 measures a voltage drop across a sense resistor, and that's where we're getting our current regulation from, and it's compared with um, a voltage that we're feeding in over here from this um, resistor network um, that's like clamped with a, a Zener diode. Uh, Zener diodes are probably not the best choice for this, they vary 1 or 2 percent over 10 or 15 minutes or so and so in the next iteration of this I'll replace it with a TL431 as a voltage reference. Um, I've actually done this in the current board, um, I just desoldered the original Zener diode and, and replaced it with a TL431 and it's, it's actually very very stable. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much all there is to it. We'll take a look at the PCB real quick. So here's the PCB. Um, these uh, large width traces at the top are our uh, current carrying traces. So obviously they're, they're as wide as I can possibly get them on the PCB. And I've actually got these duplicated um, on the backside as well um, to double the current uh, carrying capability. Um, on the reverse of the PCB, I've also removed the solder masks so that you can run a solder bead all the way along these as well um, to further you know, make sure that they don't uh, burn up on the board or anything like that. Um, let's take a look at 3D view uh, real quick because that's really cool. Um, yeah, so there's our 3D view of our fair finished product. Um, and as I said earlier on, once I designed this, I sent this off to JLC PCB who manufactured me a bunch of these for uh, really not a lot of money. Um, excellent. 
So this is the final product all assembled on the board. Very, very nice. And if we flip it around, I've got my little logo on the back there and it says 10 watt Laserdale Driver Leslie's Lab 2022. Um, I have tin plated these, um, these power rails as well um, for the additional current. Cool. So let's have a look at the final, final product, which is all of this assembled into a case with a power supply. So we'll just have a look at the front of the power supply before we open it up and take a look. I've assembled everything into a nice um, Hammond ABS box. Um, on the front we've got three LEDs. The first one is 5 volts and the, the remaining two are both emission indicators for when we'd expect the laser diode to be actually on and lazing. Um, and there's our output to the laser diode itself that I'm just using a DB9 connector for, but it should be good for 10 amps. I'm using every single pin in there, so um, it should be just fine. Uh, we've got an ammeter on the front there, um, the 10 turn vernier pot for the, uh, the current regulator circuit, a key switch and a power on uh, push switch. Um, if I turn it on real quick, if I turn the key switch nothing happens um, and only when we press the power on button does the relay click and everything power up. So currently it's reading zero because obviously we've got nothing connected to it. Um, but very very nice looking uh, front panel indeed I think. Anyway, let's have a look inside this thing. So I've just popped the lid off so we can see inside. On the right hand side here I've got a 5 volt um, 10 amp power supply. Um, that's, that's fed into another board at the back for some additional filtering to try and get rid of the switch mode noises. Actually, you know, these things are quite noisy um, in the scheme of things. So, you know, we do our best to try and get rid of as much of that noise as we possibly can. And then we've got the PCB uh, mounted down here that we saw in uh, Easy EDA there on the computer. Um, excellent. Uh, the heat sink for this, I've actually just used an old computer heat sink, but honestly it doesn't need a heat sink half as big as this. Um, I mean, you know, we're, we're dropping 5 volts to maybe 2 volts, so we're, you know, we're, we're losing a fair bit of power through the, the pass transistor there, but not too much. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, about safety features, um, I've got a key switch on this thing, um, and the key is removable in the off position, but isn't removable in the on position. You can't actually remove it. Um, and additionally, I've got an interlock circuit in here, which is why you hear the relay click when you switch it on. Um, this is a push to make switch that when you push it, it just makes one time. It, it doesn't latch or anything like that. The relay latches. And the idea behind this is if power is lost to the power supply for, you know, even a, for, for long enough that the relay will drop out, um, it won't just turn the laser back on the minute power is restored. And that's really, really important for class four lasers. Um, there's an interlock circuit in the back there as well. And so when this ends up in equipment, you can actually link this into the, the rest of the equipment so as that uh, if somebody opens a cover or whatever, it'll turn the beam off and it won't turn the beam back on until it's reset. Um, additionally, because of this, uh, this latching relay setup, it means that you can't just reach under the bench, plug this thing in and suddenly it powers up, you know, unexpectedly um, and does you some damage like before you've bothered to put um, laser safety goggles on or whatever have you. When I contacted the uh, health and security agency in the UK, um, a very, very nice fellow suggested that I get hold of this. Um, this is BSEN 60825. Um, this is the safety of laser products manual. It's quite long, it's 140 pages, but well worth a read if this is, uh, if this is something that you're interested in. On a page down at the back here, it has some specifications for the power supply. Let's see if we can route it out. Um, so we could just look it up on a handy table, right? So for class four, it says obviously it's high power diffuse reflections might even be a hazard, right? So for that, say, you know, laser safety goggles, and we'll talk about those shortly. Um, it has some additional stuff. So it says you have to have a remote interlock. Um, so it says permits easy addition of external interlock into laser installation, right? So um, also it says manual reset. So it requires a manual reset if the power is interrupted or remote interlock is actuated. And that's exactly um, what this was all about here, the, the button on the front. So if power is interrupted, it turns off or if I plug it in, it's, it, has, it is always in the off state. And only if you turn the key and press the button will the laser become active. Um, yeah, laser is inoperative when the key is removed. Um, yeah, and it's captive as well. Uh, gives a visible warning. Uh, gives a means to temporarily block the beam. So this is like part of the uh, installation itself. So, you know, we'll deal with that later on. Um, but yeah, this is uh, an, an excellent reference um, for, you know, you, when you're dealing with medium and high powered lasers, um, you should most assuredly take the time to read uh, whatever the relevant documentation is in your country. So on the subject of laser safety glasses, if you're building or experimenting with medium to high powered laser systems, uh, for whatever reason, you know, laser engravers, light shows or whatever, um, I would implore you um, to invest some money in a certified pair of laser safety glasses. 
Um, you know, eyesight is irreplaceable, right? Uh, I see a lot of grumbling on the internet and on YouTube about the, the cost of these things, right? Um, look at it this way. If you blinded yourself, how much money would you pay to get your eyesight back? And then you've got your budget, right? So if you pay like $1,000 to get your eyesight back, well, that's probably what you should be spending in the first place, right? Um, they're actually not that expensive. I'm on the Thor Labs website here, and if we scooch down the list, we can see, you know, 130 odd bucks, 170 odd bucks. Um, it's, it's not terrible, right? Um, so there's no excuse. You know, if, you, if you're gonna spend the money building lasers, I mean, it's an expensive hobby anyway. Um, so expect to spend some money on some, uh, some safety equipment. You need two pieces of information in order to um, get the correct laser safety glasses. You need to know the wavelength that you're going to protect against, and you need to be able to calculate the optical density um, that's required to attenuate that wavelength down to safe levels. Um, in my case, for a 10 watt, 808 nanometer laser diode, um, this works out an optical density of five. Um, and so if I've got 10 watts entering the laser safety glasses as a collimated beam um, with an optical density of five, I'd expect 0 0.001 to pass that, which means that about one milliwatt will make its way through the goggle um, to my eye, which is well within the, um, you know, the, the maximum permissible, uh, permissible exposure for the eye. So um, yeah. You've got some maths to do, but there are also some handy calculators out there like on Kentex website and you just plug in the values that you want. So in this case, I've plugged in 808 nanometers. Um, we expect that the average power will be no greater than 10 watts and, and it will calculate everything for you. So it says the, ox the ocular MPE or maximum permissible exposure um, is 1.64 times 10 to the minus three watts per square centimeter, which is 1.64 milliwatts. Um, and it recommends uh, an optical density of 4.199. Although, like I said, you know, I prefer wide margins, so let's, let's round it up and make it an optical density of five at that wavelength. Um, and I think that would just fine. Um, all laser safety goggles, it says default used here, 10 seconds for exposure duration. Um, all laser safety goggles, certified ones, should be rated for a time period as well. So normally it's about 10 seconds, uh, which is to say that after 10 seconds, the, the glasses are probably on fire or melting, right? Um, if, if you're the kind of person that's that careless, that it, it takes the goggles melting and dribbling down your face until you realize that there's a problem, then you should probably reevaluate your life choices, right? Um, but that's, that's the rating nonetheless. Um, so yeah, I'll link all these things in, in down below. I'll link in this site down below for the calculator, which is kind of handy. Um, I'll link in Thor Labs. Like I say, I'm not affiliated with these guys, but they seem to me to be producing, you know, to, to be selling reasonably priced uh, laser safety eyewear. Um, if you're at all concerned that about your selection, I'm sure if you drop these guys an email, they'll be very, very helpful as well, um, you know, and, and make sure that you're uh, operating lasers safely. Anyway, now that we have the laser out suitably mounted and I've designed a suitable power supply for it, let's stick this on the optical bench and have a look at it. So I have the laser diode set up here on the optical bench. It's actually bolted to it as a safety consideration. Uh, we don't want a multi-watt diode sort of just lying around on the worktop, rolling around and flapping about in the breeze where it could conceivably move and cause um, hazard or injury. In front of the laser diode output, um, I have a refractory target. This is actually a slab of graphite. And again, this is bolted to the uh, bench and completely stops uh, the entire beam so it can't go off into the lab and reflect off any surfaces or any, anything like that. Um, obviously the beam's infrared so I can't see it, although I imagine that the camera will be able to pick this up, but for my purposes um, I have an infrared detector card and if I hold it in front of the beam path when the laser's operating it'll upconvert that light into a uh, sort of yellowish green colour and you can actually see it. Um, before we power this thing on, um, safety first, so we better don the laser safety goggles. And we're safe now to power this up. So we're all powered up. I'm going to take it to just above threshold. So that would be just over an amp. So we're at 1.4 amps now and we're, we're well beyond threshold and on camera at least I can see that there's a spot on the graphite target. Uh, for my purposes I can see nothing. Um, but if I hold the infrared detector card in front of the output there I can see the greenish yellow fluorescence of the card. I'm going to turn up the wick here to about 5 amps, uh, which will correspond to an output power of about 4 watts.
So I'm at about five and a quarter amps now and I can already see on the camera screen there that the output looks very, very bright. If I hold my infrared detector card in front of the beam, um, again, for me, this is very, very brilliant greenish yellow. Excellent. So the laser diode and the power supply are working really, really quite well. Um, since this is a smoke test, it would be rude not to actually have some actual smoke. So if we put something in black in the beam there, we can see wisps of smoke coming off it. Now, you know, this is four watts of optical power. This is an incredible amount of power. If I wasn't wearing the safety glasses right now, we can see the reflection off of the graphite target is, is reflecting off of the optical bench. And, you know, I could run the risk of being blinded. So, you know, once again, safety first. But yeah, as far as the project is concerned, the power supply is working really, really well indeed. Um, I'm very satisfied with the um, output of the laser diode. And I look forward to be able to use this in a DPSS laser project. Thanks for watching this episode of Leslie's Lab. If you want to see more content like this, don't forget to hit like and subscribe down below, and I'll see you guys next time.